Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. We're looking at one of John Adams' letter books, and this one was actually one he picked up in the 1780s in London. We know that from the book plate that points out it was purchased in Cheapside. And it's fairly large and bound in what's now a rust-colored leather. It's full of a lot of different handwriting. Some of it is John Adams. Some of it is that of his nieces and nephews and secretaries and anyone who helped out in his retirement years. John Adams begins to keep a letter book that holds copies of his outgoing correspondence during the 1770s when he's at the Continental Congress, and he does so with an eye on history. The Adams family always writes for the archive, but they travel a lot. And if you're John Adams, you need a reference point for what you wrote to whom. And so this kind of functions as his reference log of information and views that he sent. Hello, and welcome to episode 231 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Historians use archives to create the histories that we love to read, watch, and listen to. So today, we're going into one archive to investigate both how historians use archives to create histories and to discover more about early American experiences with religion. Sarah Giorgini, series editor of the Papers of John Adams and an early friend of this podcast, has invited us to join her inside the Massachusetts Historical Society so that we can take a closer look at the historical details provided by the Adams Papers and the role that these manuscripts played in helping Sarah write her first book, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family. In fact, Sarah and I recorded this conversation while we had the manuscripts that proved so important to her book displayed about us on Senator Charles Sumner's desk. Yeah, it was a super history geek moment, and it's what I wanted to include you in too, which is why, as you've already heard, I recorded Sarah talking about these specific documents we looked at and placed these bits throughout the episode. Now, as we pull back the curtain on how historians work in the archive, and why Sarah felt compelled to follow the Adams family's history of religion. Sarah reveals how early American families like the Adamses used Christianity as a cultural framework to view their world and the world around them. Details about the religious experiences of the Adams family progenitors, Henry and Edith Adams, and how John, Abigail, and John Quincy Adams used religion to understand the American Revolution, the New Republic, and how the New Republic would survive and thrive in a world full of monarchies. But first, hello, Albany. I'm very excited to visit with you on Thursday, April 25th at the New York State Cultural Education Center. I'll be giving a free public talk that evening called A Visit to Ben Franklin's World. Now, just before that event, we'll gather for a meetup at the pre-talk reception. The New York State Archives Partnership Trust, who is hosting us for the evening, has arranged for the Beer Diviner, which is New York State's first licensed farm brewery to serve a selection of their finest and tastiest locally brewed selections. I've placed the details for this event in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. Finally, I'm very excited about this episode. You know, one aspect of working as a historian is being there to help your friends and colleagues with their work. So we help each other with our research by reading chapter and article drafts and providing feedback on them. And sometimes... We just show up with a cup of mint chip ice cream in hand when our friends really need it. I've been really fortunate in that Sarah let me join her on her book journey. We participated in a writing group together, and after years of hard intellectual labor, Sarah's research is finally a book. It's really an amazing experience, and I'm very excited to share it with you today. So without further ado, let's re-enter the Massachusetts Historical Society and investigate the religious lives of the Adams family. And we're looking at the letter that started it all. So this is a letter of July 19th, 1812, from John Adams to his old friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush. And he has a really lovely description of being a young boy who had rosy cheeks and carrying barley malt 
from the family brewing house. And then he segues into a little bit of a more serious reflection on the family's long past in early America. And he writes, what has preserved this race of Adamses and all their ramifications in such numbers, health, peace, comfort, and mediocrity? I believe it is religion, without which they would have been rakes, bops, sots, gamblers, starved with hunger, frozen with cold, scalped by Indians, then melted away and disappeared. My job after reading this letter was to find out if John Adams was right and if religion was really the guiding force in the family's success. Our guest is the series editor of The Papers of John Adams. She's a co-founder of the Junto, a group blog on early American history, and a contributor to both the Society for United States Intellectual History blog and a Smithsonian magazine. Today, she rejoins us to discuss details from her first book, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Sarah Giorgini. Thanks, Liz Covart, and hello to all the Ben Franklin's World listeners. Sarah, I think you may be our first four-time guest, and every time we record, we do it in a different place. It's always a pleasure to make history, and we especially want to welcome listeners into the archive today. We are taping in the heart of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the nation's oldest historical society founded in 1791, with an eye toward showcasing a few of the treasures in the Adams Papers project that led to my book, Household Gods. And I have to imagine that there must be, you know, one particular treasure that really led you to write your book, Household Gods. So would you share that treasure with us? Sure thing. So when I first came to the Adams Papers editorial project just about a decade ago, I began where every history student begins, transcribing original primary sources. And this is challenging because you have to learn someone's handwriting. You have to learn their 18th century idiosyncratic spellings and quirks. And you really start to get the voices of the past going in your head. And so luckily for me, I came into the Adams Papers on a particularly busy summer, that of 1812 in the Adams Papers. And one of the first things I learned to do was transcribe John Adams' letter books. Now, John Adams had a long and storied career as a diplomat in Europe and at home, a less successful presidency. But he always managed to keep a letter book of his travels wherever he went. And he recorded his outgoing correspondence there. Now, when I came in in 1812, that's the first time I really met John Adams. And he was that cranky Yankee of his retirement period, someone who kept an eye on world events, who had just renewed his bromance with Thomas Jefferson and kept up a long and reflective correspondence with Dr. Benjamin Rush. And so one of the first exchanges that I really got to transcribe from this letter book, which we're looking at here in the archive, and if you saw it, You would think it's been carefully conserved, but it's old, it's leather bound, it's a little rust covered in places in terms of the binding. It has, you know, kind of crinkled waterlogged places in parts because it crossed the ocean several times. And it's got a variety of different handwritings in it. In this period, often those of nieces and nephews who helped John Adams out in his retirement. And so I started to pour through the pages and The letter that jumped out to me where it all began was an exchange with Benjamin Rush, July 19th, 1812. And that was a busy summer, right, in America and in the world. And after they had kind of walked through world events, they had considered a number of really startling transformations in American culture. John Adams grew reflective about his own legacy. And he wrote this long series of letters thinking back to where his Puritan ancestors had proclaimed liberty or expressed dissent and why they had come to the new world. And here's the sentence that kicked off a decade's worth of work for me. He wrote, what has preserved this race of Adamses and all their ramifications in such numbers, health, peace, comfort, and mediocrity? I believe it is religion, without which they would have been rakes, fops, sots, gamblers, starved with hunger, frozen with cold, scalped by Indians, been melted away and disappeared. I read that sentence and I thought, really, John Adams? And I took up his cue to follow the family history of religion. Okay, so when we're talking about John Adams and the Adams family religion, what exactly are we talking about? Because early America was a place with 
a lot of different religions. So one of the things that I learned in the course of researching this project is that family history is a way to see how Americans have engaged with different religious ideas over time and how they put them to work in the world. So as I started to build the Adams family story of religion, I saw that in some ways I mirrored the narrative that we see in many in American history textbook when it comes to understanding American faith and doubt. We have Puritans turning into Congregationalists by the 18th century, then a bend toward Unitarianism during the 19th century, finally the exploration of Catholicism, non-Western faiths, and agnosticism by the end of the 19th century. And I was curious to know how Americans got there. What does it mean to be raised Christian in America? And the Adamses offered to me a very capable and well-educated set of interpreters of religious ideas. What I discovered in the course of the project is that most Americans don't learn their religion from the pulpit. They learn it from each other. And this is a really interesting part of the relationship that Americans create between religion and culture, right? How they use it. It's not just what they hear on Sundays, but how they live it out in the Monday to Saturday period, too. And I was especially interested in finding a family that could help me tell that story of what it was like to experiment with religious knowledge. People who, like the Adamses, were diplomats, were politicians, were speculators, were intellectuals, were cultural critics, but were not clergy. So I was very curious to see what a lay history of American religion would sound like coming from this family. I know we're very curious about how the Adamses learned about religion and the arc that their faith took. But before we dive into those topics, we should explore an idea. There's an idea that Sarah discusses often in her book, Household Gods. In that book, Sarah notes that Many early American families, like the Adamses, used Christianity as a cultural framework to think about and explore notions of a special identity for both their new nation and the world around them. So, Sarah, would you tell us how early Americans used Christianity as a cultural framework and what it means to use Christianity as a cultural framework? That's a terrific question because it's something that the Adamses grapple with over time in both their public and private roles. So to understand how the Adamses made their religion, we have to look back at really early England, and we have to understand the relationship between church and state, between individual and clergy. And then we have to understand this big idea of providentialism. And a large part of the work that I do in this book is to break down isms and interpret them in the way that the Adamses did, to show you how Americans encounter these big ideas. So to understand the idea of providentialism, we need to put ourselves back in that mindset of John Adams' Puritan ancestors and what their lives were like in Stuart-era Somerset, England. And the idea of providentialism is that there is an all-knowing, all-seeing, omniscient providence who intervenes in human events to fulfill a predestined plan of history. And this is something that every Adams between the Puritan era and the Civil War era identifies with strongly. This idea that there is a providentialist guy, that God will intervene in history and will direct your steps, be it to revolution, civil war, any other great moment of cultural change, and see you through those steps. And that's something I think that we need to really reconstruct first in order to understand how they came here. You mentioned that Americans really learned about religion at home from their family and not necessarily from the pulpit. And as religion is often passed down through the family, would you tell us about the progenitor of the Adams family in America, Henry Adams, and what Henry's views on religion were? So this first part of the book where I explored the Puritan ancestors of John Adams is really my favorite because I had to do a lot of world building. In the Adams papers, we have a quarter of a million manuscript pages. I have maybe a handful of items that possibly have Henry Adams, the progenitor's handwriting on them. So I really had to think about the world that he moved through in Somerset, England. And here are the three things that every Adams could agree on about the Puritan progenitor. The first was that he was well-read. He had a fairly 
comprehensive library of old books that he willed to his daughter and sons. That's the first thing we knew about him. The second thing we knew about him, he brewed good beer. So he was a malt maker by trade. And that meant that often the Adams family fortunes swung up and down with those of the harvest. And so did their prayers and their personal economy. So we knew that. And then thirdly, what we knew about Henry Adams was that he married well. So he married Edith Squire, the granddaughter of a local rector. And in doing so, he picked up 40 odd glebe or church lands on which to establish his brewing business. So these were the three ideas that I had. I also knew from John Adams' own reflections on his Puritan ancestry that Henry Adams was someone who centered his life around the meeting house, so around church, around the militia where he served in his local town. And he was someone who centered himself very much in different roots of faith inquiry. So what I mean by that is Henry Adams in his younger days in the 16 teens and 1620s would have been able to, with his neighbors, pool money and say, employ the local pulpit talent. He would be able to buy the books that he wanted and stock his library. He would be able to explore new religious ideas. And then what I quickly came to wonder was, so how'd he get here? Like, how much of a Puritan was he? And here, I think I faced the same dilemma that pretty much anyone who studies early America faces, which is, well, how can you tell if they were going for religious liberty or if they were going for profit? So how Puritan was Henry? And I didn't have a clear answer because when he decided to replant the family in Braintree, Massachusetts, now Quincy, he didn't leave me a clear paper trail. So I had to look around to find out what exactly stirred him to get on a boat and to make a very dangerous crossing to an unknown new world. And what I discovered was that family history held some clues for me. So one of the Adams relations went to John White's church in Dorset. And John White, who never left England, certainly helped the 21,000 immigrants who did. He helped to fund the charter for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he preached colonization sermons that used providentialism to exhort people to replant what he called the petty colonies, so that was their family, to replant themselves in the New Jerusalem of New England. And he was incredibly effective. So I didn't know exactly when the moment was that Henry said, aha, this is for me. But I do know the sermons he heard and the ones he may have read, like John White's A Planter's Plea. And I thought about how that would have played at home. So how they would have debated that at home, what they would have thought their opportunities were. And then there's a wave of bad harvest and Henry loses his brewer's license. So now there's a combination of ideas. There's increasing encouragement from the pulpit to go and restore some Christianity to the new world. There's also the idea that Henry is out of luck in terms of his business. And then there's a third really pivotal factor that causes the Adamses to leave England for America. And that is the religious atmosphere that is inculcated by Archbishop William Laud. Now, William Laud takes over the Church of England and begins to lead it in 1633. And he has some incredibly strong tactics that he puts into immediate force. So the look and feel of Church of England religion changes dramatically in the 1630s. There are interrogatories, which are so dreaded, and they're kind of like a pop quiz to say, does a mother like Edith Adams, Henry's wife, remember to don a modest veil after she comes back from church every time she has a child? Does Henry stock the right kinds of books in his library? Do they agree to genuflect at the newly railed altar in their old church of Barton St. David? So there's this very different religious atmosphere that is so pivotal. Those three things trigger the Adamses to leave England and come to America. So the look and feel of the Church of England had changed a lot during the 1630s. But I also have to imagine that life and worship were also pretty different and had a very different feel for the Adamses once they arrived in America. So what was the state of Christian religion in Massachusetts when Henry and Edith Adams arrived in the colony? What the Adamses didn't realize was that they had traded one scene of religious turmoil for another. 
their meeting house, what would become today the United First Parish Church in Braintree eventually, was also the 15th Congregationalist community founded Massachusetts Bay. And they were in a state of flux when the Adamses arrived. Following the antinomian controversy, which hinged on whether or not a radical prophetess like Anne Hutchinson could claim salvation by direct contact with God, the people of that Quincy Braintree area were experiencing a fundamental shift in how they lived out their religion, and they didn't have a pastor for some time. They struggled through. They created a new covenant. They thought about ways that town and church should stay bonded together and how they shouldn't. And something that I had to, again, put myself in kind of the shoes of Henry and Edith as much as possible was to recreate the sensory world of religion. So something that would have been very different to them would have been, say, a call to worship. Now, if they were back home in Barton St. David, it would have been Anglican church bells peeling out. But it was a very different situation here in New England. They would have seen red flags of silk bunting. They would have heard a solo drummer calling them to prayer. And they would have walked into a New England meeting house that really, the best way to describe it is sort of a cold, unheated schoolroom. They would have accepted communion from the deacon's pew, a little table that was hinged and came down. And that meeting house was also the place for trials, elections, surgery, you named it. So it was a very busy room. Prayer was one thing that happened there, but it was not the only thing. And reconstructing the contrast in their old world religion and their new world religion was one of the richest parts of the research for me. Because what I came to see is that every Adam's generation is fixated not on the theology of ritual, but on the aesthetics of it. And by that, I mean the real sensory experience. So I worked really hard to think about, well, what did that service sound like? What did that incense smell like? Because those were the kinds of details that I found in their archive. Wow. It must have been a big challenge for people who cared a whole lot about the aesthetics of religion to all of a sudden find themselves worshiping in a place that kind of sounds like it functioned like a community center. I mean... There's just such a sharp contrast here. That's exactly right. It does function like a community center. And with it, you have to imagine all the conversations that are held there and how that shapes the intellectual atmosphere of then praying in it. So they often, for example, would keep the meeting house doors open so that you could see the stocks, which is a very present reminder, right, that you don't want to step out of line in this early New England township, but also a reminder that there is a community with shared morals that you are definitely a part of. And that was just really interesting to me. So even though I only had a few scraps, you know, Henry's signature on his will or a mention of him somewhere else, I had a really good sense after a lot of research of how to build his religious worlds that he walked through. Now, in Household Gods, Sarah poses a really interesting question for her readers which is, what did the Puritan experience of Henry and Edith Adams teach their descendants about religion and rebellion? Sarah, that's such a great question. And I wonder if you would help us answer it right after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. Sarah has really helped us and she'll continue to help us See how we can use the Adams family to better understand the lived experiences of religion in early America. Of course, as we know, the Adams family provides us with just one window onto the early American past. And that was a past full of religious ideas. Which is why you may like to know that the Omohundro Institute has published many books about religion in early America. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OIbooks and then put religion into the search bar. When you do this, You'll find titles that will guide you through ideas about religious community in New England and Pennsylvania, the missionary movement in California, and the ways in which religion intertwined with social and cultural ideas about family, childbirth, and slavery. And because you're a loyal Ben Franklin's World listener, the Omohundro Institute is offering you a special promo code so that you can purchase any title published by the OI at a 40% discount. Just use your special promo code 01DAH40. 
Again, save 40% off any OI book title by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash OI books and using promo code 01DAH40. I place the details for this listener-only sale in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. So Sarah, you asked us to think about what the Puritan experience of Henry and Edith Adams taught their descendants about religion and rebellion. And now we'd like to know what you think. So what did the Puritan experience of Henry and Edith Adams teach their descendants about religion and rebellion? Well, so John Adams, a far better author than I on this subject, took a crack at exactly that question first in his dissertation on the canon and the feudal law in 1765. And his idea, even though he was a little hazy about his own Puritan origins and in fact sparred with his son, John Quincy, on them, he had this idea in his head that what the Puritans gifted to Americans was, first of all, this abiding religious confidence that God would help a colonist to dare much and to do good. So there's that idea. There's the idea that before they were capital C congregationalists, they were lowercase c congregationalists. They knew how to gather in community, maintain an individual identity, yet pull together for something like a revolution. They had, thirdly, a long and rich tradition in religion. So in the line of church before in the line of state in articulating dissent and proclaiming liberty. So anyone who is willing to flee the corrosive hands of an Archbishop Laud would feel empowered to stand up to, well, any form of British authority that might challenge liberty. So in essence, religion actually gave them the confidence they needed to rebel. I think that's true. I think that's exactly the way that they parlayed it, especially John Adams. You have to remember, too, that claiming that Puritan ancestry is incredibly important if you're building a political brand in the 18th century. And the Adamses knew that. And John Adams was very aware, as his son John Quincy was, that claiming that Puritan ancestry of dissent and liberty was a way to establish a glossy status history in the new American political arena. Now, speaking of John and his wife, Abigail Adams, we've learned, of course, about John's religious forebear. And Abigail was the daughter of a minister, so she also had a religious upbringing at home and in the meeting house. So would you tell us about John and Abigail Adams's Christian views and whether they saw eye to eye on religion? Abigail Adams looked for God in books first as a young woman. She had the privilege of her father, a clergyman in Weymouth serving as a guiding intellectual force in her life and opening his library to her. And so she read a lot of English dissenters. She had some of the same religious ideas when she met John Adams. And they both had a very strong sense of providentialism. Again, that idea that God would guide them through historical events and help to shape their destiny. But Abigail had something a little different than John. She had a great love of religion and its aesthetics as a form of culture. And when Abigail traveled, when she was an older woman and she traveled in Europe, this was something that she really noticed. So she absolutely adored hearing high church music, not something she would have heard or really thought about favorably as a young woman in Weymouth. This was a very different thing to her. We have some really striking passages in letters where she describes the first time she hears Handel's Messiah, and she describes the Alleluia chorus, how all of the instrument players will rise with one accord and, you know, the building is just reverberating with all the joy of the music. And this is incredibly emotional stuff for Abigail to come up with and to write about in her letters. And she's very evocative about it. So she looks for religion in parts of culture that John necessarily would not. He has a slightly different view of other religions. He experiences his first Catholic mass while he's at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And true to his 18th century roots, he's curious and cosmopolitan. He's not particularly tolerant of it. He is surprised that he ends up on a Philadelphia side street half gagging from the incense. So there are some ways in which they open themselves to the sensory aesthetics of religious worship. And there are some ways in which they really double down on the liberal congregationalist tradition that they have learned in New England. 
I'm really curious about the role of the Enlightenment and John and Abigail's religious views, because the Enlightenment was an age where science and rational ideas were taking aim at religion. And yet here we have this enlightened couple that seems to be really steeped in religion. So I wonder, you know, as you put it in Household Gods, how John and Abigail work to reconcile Enlightenment Euro Christianity with the mysterious sovereignty of providence over their lives. So this is the project of their lives. And when I was writing the book, I kept using a phrase, Enlightenment Christianity. And I eventually axed it because my very liberal and supportive dissertation advisor, John Roberts at Boston University, said, and what is that exactly? And I said, oh, I've got to think about what that means. And for the Adamses, what it means is they have this blend. They have this blend of Scottish common sense philosophy. They have this interest in scientific reason. And then they have this completely unscientific adherence to providentialism, which can feel kind of very early modern for us to look at. And so I started to look back at some of their letters and I thought, well, let me understand where they're able to use all of these kinds of language at once. And one of the most remarkable letters that I found was from Abigail Adams to her daughter-in-law, actually, to Louisa Catherine Adams. And she's sort of fighting through some of these questions you just outlined of what does Enlightenment Christianity really mean? How can we combine this all to make sense? And she says, what can we reason but from what we know? So I thought, aha, this is how she blends together reason and Christianity. There's something she's willing to accept, not wholly as divine mysteries, but she is willing to accept them, but still continue to ask about them. There's this wonderful thing about the Adamses from generation to generation that I discovered in the course of my research, which is they come very close to being scientists of religion. So what we would think of as kind of a sociology of religion, how people use it, what they learn, what their ideas are, this fascinates them far more than any kind of dogma or theology. Now, speaking of the letters you looked at, One of my favorite letters from the Adams Papers is the one that Abigail wrote to John on June 18, 1775. And I really love this letter because it specifically describes the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is a battle I used to talk about all the time when I worked for the National Park Service. Now, you told me once that this letter does more than just talk about the decisive day. You said that it actually demonstrates how the Adamses relied on their faith to make sense of the American Revolution. So I wonder if you would tell us about Abigail's decisive day letter and how it illustrates the Adams's fate. This is one of my favorite Abigail Adams letters, maybe my favorite in our entire collection. And so here is a really good trajectory of providentialism in one letter. And I'm just going to read a little snippet of it so you get a taste. This is Abigail writing to John. And she's writing one of her long journal letters, and she starts it on Sunday, June 18th, and she finishes it on Tuesday, the 20th. And she's writing just after the Battle of Bunker Hill. They've just lost their good friend and family doctor, Joseph Warren, at the battle. And this is really the first news that John is going to get of it. And she writes, The day, perhaps the decisive day, is come on which the fate of America depends. My bursting heart must find vent at my pen. I have just heard that our dear friend, Dr. Warren, is no more, but fell gloriously fighting for his country. And then Abigail continues in the second paragraph, and she does something that she does a lot, and a lot of the Adamses do, which is kind of a mashup of different scriptural verses. And this part is pulled specifically from Ecclesiastes and from the 62nd Psalm. And she writes, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but the God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Trust in him at all times, ye people, pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Charlestown is laid in ashes. And to me, this was just so evocative of bearing this news to her absent husband, of trying to show the personal and public toll of this conflict so early on. And it's rare that Abigail would quote that much of the Bible, and yet she does here. She continues the letter two days later with a very long ode that she apparently had young John Quincy recite every morning along with the Lord's Prayer, so much so that he remembered it when he was an old man many years later in his diary. And she ends the letter 
in a completely different place than she began it. She begins again on Tuesday by saying that she's heard 10,000 reports that are passing vague and uncertain as the wind. And you have to think of how news traveled and how she is trying to frame this. You asked about how we use Christianity as a cultural framework. She had tried to do that the first day when she heard the news, and she is still trying to do that two days later. And so she quotes a long old, and then she writes, the spirits of the people here are very good. The loss of Charlestown affects them no more than a drop in the bucket. And so we see a whole trajectory of someone who appeals to Providence during a great historical event, expects Christianity to serve as both her language and interpreter and guide of this incredible loss, and really sets it aside to mourn, to grieve, comes back to it with kind of a renewal of faith and gives us this incredible line of we know this is just the beginning and that there is more to see and Providence will guide us through. And so while this letter is famous for being this incredible primary source event of the Battle of Bunker Hill, it also gives us a wonderful lesson in how early Americans practice faith and doubt and how she uses Christianity to frame the story. How about another example? You just showed us how Christianity could be used to frame the story. And so I wonder about the framing of the election of 1800. We happen to know the election of 1800 as one of the most acrimonious elections in history, as it pitted John Adams against his sometimes friend, sometimes enemy, Thomas Jefferson. And I wonder, did the Adamses use Christianity as a way to make sense of John Adams's loss to Jefferson in this election? That's a really interesting question because our forthcoming volume of the Family Correspondence, which will be out in spring 2019, chronicles the private and public toll of that period of campaigning going into the election of 1800. And while there's not a ton of religious imagery in those letters, they certainly use it in the years that follow. There's an idea that's especially prevalent in early 19th century America that When you face something terrible, the loss of an election, the loss of his youngest son, Charles, to alcoholism, just an incredible retreat from public life that is unexpected at that moment, you are entering into what Christians call the school of affliction. There are lessons to learn. Now, whether or not the Adamses acclimate easily to that school of affliction, I wouldn't be able to say. But what we do see is an increasing turn to more Christian language in their retirement years. So from 1801 to about 1826, there is a lot more Christian language in use, but there's also a real curiosity about other faiths that we see that we hadn't seen before in John Adams' correspondence. Now, as Household Gods is a family history, I'd really like for us to move on to the religious explorations of John Quincy Adams. Now, we know that John Adams' diplomatic career during and after the American Revolution really afforded his family and his eldest son, the opportunity to travel in Europe. In fact, John Quincy accompanied his father to Europe at such a young age that he probably spent more time abroad than he did in Massachusetts. So Sarah, I wonder, with so much time abroad during his youth, what was John Quincy Adams' religious upbringing like, given that he really couldn't attend worship in the congregational meeting houses of his parents? So this is a really interesting thing about John Quincy Adams, sometimes referred to by his own family as the greatest traveler of the age. He has his first diplomatic gig going to Russia when he's 12 years old. He is off in Europe attending Leiden University. He jets back to Harvard, a formative place for many in Adams when it comes to religious education. And he is really plunged fully into foreign experience, more so than his native Quincy. And this makes him not only incredibly cosmopolitan, but it makes him a great critic of world religions. And he's someone who's incredibly curious as he's moving through the steps of diplomatic apprenticeship that every Adams does in learning how to use religion as a couple of things. So it's a social technology. He takes a little time to warm up to people. And this is a way that he can look like he's part of the community. He says he always likes to be The friendly American in a foreign pew is kind of how he frames it, no matter the denomination. And he will put that to good use by praying anywhere and everywhere that he can. He's really curious about other denominations beyond Protestant Christianity as well. So he is very adroit at moving through different religious communities and finding exactly 
the religious idea that he can be a part of, that he can espouse. And then the second thing that he's able to do is to learn how to use religion as a cultural language. And his wife, Louisa Catherine, is very adept at this as well. So even though they're moving through an array of foreign courts, they are able to connect in conversation with people on topics like Christian patriotism or Christian motherhood, you know, kind of the universals that they're interested in. So he has a very different upbringing and he struggles quite a bit with it. And he struggles with it most when he becomes a father and he isn't quite sure how to educate his children except to drown them in reading lists of books, which is a very Adam's approach to education, I think. Could you give us an example of how John Quincy Adams used religion as a gateway to developing a better understanding of cultures? Perhaps you could even tell us something about his relationship with the Tsar of Russia. So John Quincy Adams in Russia is a revelation because he is a young man. He is a husband. He is a father. His son, Charles Francis, is with him and Louisa Catherine. He is in Russia for the second time. The last time he was there was to seek American recognition from Catherine the Great. And he is now back to try and craft a trade treaty with Tsar Alexander I, a mission that does not come to fruition, but a mixed time of great happiness and great loss for the Adams family. His wife gives birth to a daughter who dies very young, and Adams, in his grief, turns to a self-implemented course of religious education to find out everything he can about the many different kinds of faiths in Russia. And one of the most striking things to me is that when he contrasts St. Petersburg with New England, he finds that Russians are more religiously tolerant and diverse than his own home state. So he's very interested in all the little details of how people celebrate the life cycle. He goes and sees his first Catholic baptism. He marks where they bury their dead, how they're baptized, when they're married. He's fascinated by the frozen markets to understand how religion and the marketplace are in sync. He really dives into the specifics of religious education as well. So he wants to know when religious schools have their lessons, what they teach, how they're trained. And this just fascinates him. So on that note of Adams is serving as sociologist of religion, I knew that I had my work cut out for me with John Quincy Adams. And in fact, that was the chapter I wrote first. And it was the longest chapter. And I probably could have kept on writing it. And that was the chapter where when I was writing it, I thought, I've got to look at the Adamses more before and after him because there might be a big story here. Since you do know so much about John Quincy Adams and his quest for faith, would you tell us about his deep appreciation for the Bible? Where did his interest in the Bible as a text come from? You know, it's funny because his grandson, Henry Adams, he of the education, says that every Adams gets a silver christening mug and a Bible. And that's your first gift as an Adams. And certainly with John Quincy Adams, we see an early appreciation for the Bible. He learns it at home. Remember that at this time, and this is another reason why family history is so important to understand spirituality in America, the home is the primary site for religious education and sentimental devotion. And so he learns at home. He reads a couple of chapters of the Bible every morning before he works and usually notes down his diary, what he's read and a little reflection on it. He becomes an officer of some standing for a long time in the American Bible Society, which is incredibly important for the early 19th century. And he really takes the time to write a series of letters on the Bible to his two sons who are far away in Massachusetts because he thinks their religious education, while it's nice to maybe read a Bible verse or two at night, it's not enough. So he has this larger vision of the Bible that he wants to impart to them. You should read it as a historical guide. You should read it as spiritual interpretation. And you should use it to discern your role in history and your duty to your nation. So there's very much an idea in John Quincy Adams' mind that the Bible is a wellspring of Christian patriotism and that you should be as familiar with it as you possibly can be. Speaking of duty to one's nation, we can really see a trend in the Adams family where they do have a strong sense of duty to the nation. John Quincy's parents really used religion to make sense of the American Revolution. And John Quincy Adams was using religion as a way to try and figure out how the American nation would survive in a world full of monarchies. So, Sarah, 
How exactly did John Quincy Adams use religion to come to his belief that the American Republic and Republicanism could survive among so many monarchies? So he is kind of our model Christian patriot. We see this a lot in John Quincy Adams' actions. We see it in his letters. We see it even in his poetry, where he very clearly lays out different ways to approach his creator, as he calls it, and to discern what steps he needs to take next for the new nation. I think if we really needed to explain his political creed in Christian terms, so to apply that idea of cultural framework of Christianity here, we would say, you know, he's providentialist. He's patriotic and Protestant to the core. Those are the three kind of guiding lights that carry him through his service. It's always interesting to wonder if he hadn't traveled so much, would he still have this broad cosmopolitan idea of Christianity? And I just don't know. Now, the question of how to be simultaneously Christian and American really seemed to be the defining challenge of these early Adams' lives. So, Sarah, Why do you think this proved to be such a challenge? And would you tell us about some of the different ways these early members of the Adams family attempted to meet this challenge? I'm so happy for this question because I think it gets to the root of why I study early America and the long shadows that it casts throughout the 19th and 20th century. But also what I find to be really the fundamental question that any historian of American life in general should ask, which is, How do Americans try to maintain an individual identity, i.e. Christianity, while also belonging to a larger community, i.e. America? So this tension between how do I keep my religious beliefs intact? How do I explore new ideas? What's the middle ground there? Those are all ideas that propel me to keep researching and writing both in the Adams papers and beyond them. You know, when we started our conversation, you made sure to tell us that your book, Household Gods, was specifically a family history, which sounds a lot to me like a case study. And historians often conduct case studies because it really allows them to take a smaller piece of a larger idea and see how it plays out and works at a more granular level. So I wonder what you think the Adams family's views and journey through Christian religion can really reveal about the wider early American journey and views on Christianity? That's a big question. And I think that the Adams manuscripts leave us some clues to understand, first of all, how Americans pull together their private personal beliefs with what they do in the political arena. For the Adamses, it's always a real struggle. There is no clear moment in a diary or a letter where I say, aha, I know how that president prayed that day before that vote. So there's only so much of the interior life that you can get at through manuscripts. I think, secondly, another way that the Adams family story opens up a new realm of history to write is to understand the family again as something that is a really dynamic and vibrant intellectual site for historians to explore. So families pass along religious ideas and practices in a way that churches and clergy and All the letter books in the world can't wholly record. And so understanding how that idea of the Christian family, a microcosm of peace, stability, godliness, and goodness came to be is, I think, a really interesting part of this project that spoke to me quite a bit. I did. And I have to say, when I started this project, I had a lot of people say, well, you know, why the Adamses? You know, there's been so much on them. And I thought, well, but don't you want to know what their religious beliefs were and how they passed them on. And I looked for families West and South for comparison's sake. I considered a few, but I was really interested in this three century story of the laity narrating American faith. And I want to be clear about this and doubt. Is there also something in the Adams's experience that you think could also tell us something about our own present day? I think the Adamses struggled quite a bit with the notion of public and private spheres. So what ideologies they wanted to discuss at home and what they were willing to share, not online in their day, but certainly in their letters, speeches, they were incredibly public people. And I think what we forget sometimes is that they were easily the most famous family in America for much of the 19th century and not wholly the most popular one. So they really had to reckon publicly with 
former presidencies, former legacies, this incredible archive that they wrote for their different actions in the political sphere. I think that they really struggled. And I think that people who struggle today with how to reconcile their personal religious beliefs with their public politics would appreciate the stories that we see in Household Gods, because it's a completely different side of the Adamses. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that every family has its own saga. And you really see that play out in the Adamses, but also in any family history today. I'm really struck by the fact that whenever I talk about this project, I'm fortunate that people come up and say, well, you know, we have a really interesting history of religion in our family, and this is what we believe. And I get a whole new host of book ideas out of it. So that's been a wonderful part of the process. Now we should jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Adams family had not had the opportunity to live and work abroad? How might their views of Christianity and their use of it as a lens through which to view American life have been different? I think they would have still traveled through books. They were an incredibly curious lot. And as we know from their multiple libraries held at the Massachusetts Historical Society, at the Adams National Historical Park, and also at Boston Public Library, we have a good sense of all the different faiths that they explored. I think that they might not have been quite so critical. They really hone their critical edge when they're abroad and they're reflecting on a strange minister's words or what other people in the pews had to say or what the church looked like. And we might have missed that part of their reflections if they had not traveled so much. So what's next for you, Sarah? Will you be following the Adams family into a new era of history? Well, next up for Papers of John Adams, Volume 20, we are exploring the world of the first federal Congress and how John Adams creates the office of the vice presidency. In my own research, I am a little farther away from the first federal Congress and currently exploring how state constitutions change throughout the long 19th century. And we always have questions about the Adamses. So would you share your contact information with us again? We encourage folks who are interested in the Adamses to reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, and our website at the Massachusetts Historical Society. That's M-A-S-S-H-I-S-T dot O-R-G. And there are plenty of Adams resources to explore. One thing I'd like to say, in addition to coming here to work with our archives, which are available also as free digital editions online, I'd encourage everyone to walk where the Adams walked and visit the fantastic scholarly Rangers team at the Adams National Historical Park. Sarah Giorgini, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for inviting us into the Massachusetts Historical Society today and for taking us through the religious journeys of the Adams family. Thank you so much. So we're looking at one of Abigail Adams' long journal letters that she writes during the American Revolution to her husband, John, then at the Continental Congress. And Abigail writes these slightly longer letters. She often drafts and changes her words over the course of a couple of days. She's trying to pack in as much information as she can, knowing that their letters may also be intercepted, read, printed. Anything she sends may be compromised. So she likes to make sure that she has captured the news as best she can. And she'll often come to a point in the writing where it's either emotional for her or the events are still in flux and she will hold the letter and then send it. And this is what happens with her letter of Sunday, June 18th, 1775, which we're looking at. And she again continues on the afternoon of Tuesday, the 20th. And she's conveying news of the Battle of Bunker Hill. And we see in Abigail's hand where she's carried in a word or she's canceled or deleted or struck out a word to change it, where she has changed the time when the bombardment at Bunker Hill ends. She's changed the time because she has new intel to share with her husband. 
And so these letters, which are always astonishing to me that they've survived and been taken such good care of by the family and the historical society, it's probably about an 11 by 14 piece of paper. It's a manuscript. It's kind of a cotton-based, slightly heavier kind of paper that you would have seen here. And she is conveying the information as quickly as she can. Something you notice a great deal with Abigail is that she is a self-educated woman. She didn't have the same opportunities for a formal education that her husband or her sons did. And so her spelling is going to be a little non-standard in places. She tends to write phonetically. So sometimes it's a great way to get Abigail's voice in your head to know how she pronounced things. And when we reproduce these in transcription, we reproduce exactly what she wrote. So every little semicolon quirk or non-standard spelling appears just as Abigail wrote it. And that's part of the work that we do. Every family has its own saga, and the Adams family certainly had one of its own. Throughout their storied careers in the service of the United States, the Adamses relied on religion. Now, Sarah began to follow the Adams family's journey with religion early on in her career with the Adams Papers editorial project. She started where most scholars begin, with transcribing documents. She transcribed the letters of the Adamses by learning their handwriting, quirks, and different spellings. Also, she could get their voices going in her head. Now, one letter jumped out to her, John Adams's July 19, 1812 letter to Benjamin Rush, in which Adams noted that what had preserved his family throughout time and throughout all of the challenges and troubles they had faced had been religion. From there, Sarah followed John Adams's cue and traced the family's lived experiences with Christianity. For Edith and Henry Adams, this was an experience of Puritanism, where a desire to escape William Laud's changes to the Church of England, practice their faith without interference, and improve the fortunes of their family, compelled these first Adamses to sail across the Atlantic and to settle in Braintree, Massachusetts during the 17th century. Now, the religious experiences of John and Abigail Adams picked up two generations later, and it included the providentialism of their Puritan forebears. That idea that there is an all-knowing, all-seeing, omniscient providence who intervenes in human events to fulfill a predestined plan of history. And John and Abigail put this inherited providentialism to work, as both thought about the ways they could use its tenants to see them through the American Revolution and all of the challenges it posed for them. But these were not the only Adamses to experience and grapple with Christian ideas. In John Quincy Adams, we can see how this family's religious journey extended across another generation. Within his diary, letters, and poetry, we can see how John Quincy Adams wrestled with the providentialism of his parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and how he used it to help him navigate the foreign countries and courts and domestic disputes he had to in the service of his nation. As Sarah revealed, it's through the Adams manuscripts that we can see a close-up example of how early Americans struggled with both faith and doubt, and how they tried to reconcile their religion with their politics. Plus, this multi-generational manuscript collection in the Massachusetts Historical Society also reveals the importance of family history. Families pass along religious and cultural ideas in ways that church and municipal records simply can't capture or record. But family histories open a window onto these ideas and practices for historians, making the family a dynamic and vibrant intellectual site for us to investigate and to better understand our early American past. Look for more information about Sarah, her book, Household Gods, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 231. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends and family about it. The Omohundro Institute has been the proud publisher of award-winning books since 1943. And right now, it's offering you a special Ben Franklin's World listener discount on any book it's published. Simply visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OIbooks and use promo code 01DAH40 to save 40% on any OI title. Again, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OIbooks and use promo code 01DAH40. Production assistance for this episode comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Kim Foley, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our theme music. Finally, did you enjoy our trip into the archive? 
Sarah has one more document to share with you, but when you're done with your visit, I'd love to hear about other historical sources and archives that you'd like to know more about. So send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. One of the most epic diarists of the 19th century was certainly John Quincy Adams, who, like his parents, had a rage for the archive and for creating history. Over the course of his life, he kept 50 volumes worth of a diary that you can read in either a quick line a day version or in this longer version that we're looking at here. And this has all been digitized and made available through the Historical Society. And we happen to be looking at the entry for March 29th, 1841. And he opens his diary with when he woke up in the morning and who visited him and his early tasks. And really, of all the diary entries, and there are so many (laughs) that John Quincy has provided us with, this is one of my personal favorites, because I think it tells us a lot about how he applied Christianity to politics. And it's written about a month after the Amistad decision, which you can learn about through the Historical Society website. But he's reflecting on what he should do next. And he asks in his diary, you know, what can I do? How can I carry forward this cause? And he acknowledges that it will be a challenge. He writes, the world, the flesh, and all the devils in hell are arrayed against any man who now in this North American Union shall dare to join the standard of Almighty God to put down the African slave trade. And so the the part that really gets me about this is John Quincy Adams' very clear explication of what his conscience tells him to do. And you see this man who is really at the end of his political career and is determined to cap it with one last moral crusade. And so he writes, what can I, upon the verge of my 74th birthday, with a shaking hand, a darkening eye, a drowsy brain, and with all my faculties dropping from me, one by one, as the teeth are dropping from my head, what can I do for the cause of God and man, for the progress of human emancipation, for the suppression of the African slave trade? Yet my conscience presses me on. Let me die upon the breach.